Hi, I'm Antonio Garcia from Virginia Commonwealth University, and on behalf of all of my colleagues on the Board of Directors of the Midwest Clinic, we welcome you to the 2020 Midwest Clinic, Staying Connected. When you speak with Wynton Marsalis, you're not talking only with a performing artist. You're also engaging with a band leader, composer, educator, artistic director, business person, and a leading advocate for American culture. Certainly well known for his classical musicianship, his core beliefs and foundation for living are rooted in the principles of jazz. He advocates for individual creativity, improvisation, collective cooperation, swing, gratitude and good manners, sophistication, and faces adversity with persistent optimism, the blues. In past visits to the Midwest Clinic, Winton has inspired us not only with his playing, but also with his perspectives and hopes for the future. So, amid the many crises of 2020, we at the Midwest Clinic asked Winton for his thoughts as to where we are as musicians, as students, as educators, as a nation, as a world, and where those intersect. He suggested that we speak on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, so as to have current context for our conversation. On behalf of the Midwest Clinic Board of Directors and all our viewers, thank you for being with us today. Um, I also want to thank you on behalf of my three-year-old grandson who uh, watched uh, Sesame Street with my wife and the broadcast with Lincoln Center and uh, brought great smiles to his face. Oh, man, love to him and congratulations, Grandpa. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's a great joy. It is a great joy. Yeah, right. And uh, I also caught earlier in the, uh, in the month uh, the uh, Democracy Sweep broadcast that you did. It's one of so many different uh, broadcasts that you and Lincoln Center have done since uh, the pandemic hit. And uh, so I guess my first uh, question to you is, uh, is related to jazz and democracy, something you've been uh, speaking about for many years. I remember distinctly the, the, the materials you did with Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, the Honorable Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, many years ago. Uh, but now here we're talking, it's the week of Thanksgiving, and across the American and possibly beyond the American Thanksgiving table, we have a, a lot of division in our country. Uh, democracy is a messy thing, and uh, but it moves forward. And uh, I wonder if as musicians and as citizens, if you have, first of all, any thoughts you'd like to share about where we are now and, and where we hope to go. Sure. Our, our system for it to begin to work is going to require a lot more investment from us. It's like anything that breaks. You, you buy something and it starts not to work. You start trying to figure out why is it not working? What can we do to make it better? Uh, there's some suggestions I have is that it, it's, it's, it's too big for what it's designed to do. And I think that once you have a really big system and no one understands how it works, it becomes very sophisticated. Its corruption is also sophisticated. At this point, the government is now a very sophisticated kleptocracy. And um, we as citizens have to become more involved. I think this vote, the voter turnout, regardless of the outcome, is an indication of the first level of what we need to do. And when we look at citizens like Stacey Abrams and what she did in Georgia, once again, not because of her, her, her party affiliation, because of what she did as a citizen, we start to see what, what we need to do to activate each other as citizens. I think we need much more engagement with civics and a greater degree of education. Because for, for a democracy, citizens have to be acute in their thinking, they have to be very, very reasoned. And when you don't have education and a way to discern fact from feeling, you, is, you're easily manipulated by a cheap populism. As musicians, we see that because now our field is overrun with people who can't play any music at all but they are uh, they're celebrated and they they have music that feels good that appeals they use the tools that, that are at their disposal technology profanity different things that while they have their place that place is not the mainstream uh, because it's too destructive to your to your internal core and your, your morality um another thing i think that's important for us is if you look at the way our system works it's community based and not neighborhood based so community means you have some type of financial engine you have shops, stores, people who participate, and there's, a, there's a, a concern for civics. Then the city, that's like the police and the mayor and the, uh, the, the city council and so on and so forth. And then it's the state with the state legislature and the governor and the, the lieutenant governor. And 
and uh, so on and so forth, the, the state police, and then it's the federal government. So with, with the president and the, the, and the, the judicial branch and the, and, the, and the Congress, and when you don't, as a, as a younger person, perceive how those layers work, you're not able to function inside of the system. And it makes you susceptible to, to just being a taxpayer whose money goes to a representative who only represents elites that allow them to get more money. And it becomes kind of a, a self-defeating system. So I think this kind of has been the first rung of people in America saying, we want this type of leadership, but there's not really a big difference. Not as big a difference as we're being led to believe. Mm -hmm between Republicans and Democrats. If you think there's a big difference, go to your colleges and universities and ask yourself, do I know who's a Republican or a Democrat? Walk through neighborhoods, say, do I know who's a Republican or a Democrat? When you, when you look at the segregation by race, by age, by, by, by gender, the different groups we fall into, class determines more than party affiliation. We are less state affiliated than we need to be to have the electoral system work the way we have. Hmm. The thought is that a person in Pennsylvania will be more concerned with things that go on in Pennsylvania than they will be with the Democratic Party. And the thought is that a person in a local uh, community will be more concerned with voters in their area than they would be with the national outcome. We actually have seen that system work in this time because you'll notice how each person, regardless of party affiliation, who has been called upon to comment on this election has spoken from the standpoint of the procedures and the integrity of, of, the, of the, the voting process in their state. Right. And they've been very vociferous and de definitive about defending their practices. So that gives us a good, good kind of baseline into the separation of the, the, the central question of, of our democracy, which is once again, it's the states versus the strong authority of the federal government, as it is also the individual in relationship to the community. But if you see the reinforcements on different levels, and then you see like your grandkids, your kids, you, it's reinforced. And then you and your parents and your grandparents. So it's, it's, it's a tiered kind of relationship you have as the generations pass to information of course, genetically is, is what it is, a fact of science, but from a cultural standpoint, in terms of your traditions and your beliefs and your, your mythology, it's the layering across generations. Also, it is in our way of government. I think many of us have no idea how our government works. One of the challenges of, as you mentioned, individuals in the community and knowing that Midwest Clinic attendees are by and large primarily music educators this December and always, one of the challenges that I feel uh, as a music educator is that in teaching music, uh, we have to teach culture. Uh, it's, it really seems very empty to me to try to teach a classical or a jazz musician any kind of music without sharing why that music exists and what that person was trying to express at the time. And certainly in my daily work of jazz in particular, so much of jazz, of course, is based on uh, expressions of oppression and liberation, of, of, uh, of segregation and hope, and, and these these great alternatives that are in front of us and behind us and in front of us. So one of the challenges I, I perceive in my, my brethren uh, in, in music education is that uh, since we are a very divided country and even internationally, uh, teaching some of the music with the knowledge of the culture can be more challenging because we know our, the students and or their, their parents and or the community are not necessarily united in how they're going to view that information. And uh, it, you know, it, it can cause a certain challenge in trying to stay authentic to the true truth of the music at the time. So I just wondered in terms of the role of, of music educators at this crossroads in our, in our timeline, if you feel as though there's a, any particular um, challenge, responsibility, motivation, inspiration, you know, you can share with us about trying to keep the music authentic, no matter what kind of music we're speaking to, uh, despite the, the challenging divisions that we have here? Education is tied to aspiration. And we as teachers are teaching a, a, a mythology, right? Art is consciousness and it's mythology made physical. So it, we're teaching the story of us in music. It's a, 
it's creation art. You, you, you're playing something you created, even if you're, if you're playing a piece that John Philip Sousa wrote, nobody, most people in the audience don't know who wrote it. So it's creation. You create the performance. It's recreation. It's something that John Philip Sousa wrote. It's something that has been played before. And it's recreation. It can also be entertainment. But because we're teaching it, we're not teaching the entertainment part of it as much as we're te teaching the substance part of it. So we have to distinguish. It's like a teacher goes in a math class. It's really a funny teacher. Great. But the teacher's not there to be funny. The teacher may be funny and you have a great time in class, but the teacher is there to teach you particulars of math. As music teachers, there are particulars of music. In America, we have problems teaching because the racism kept us from embracing the best of our musical traditions. Now's the time for us to readdress that, not by lowering our standards to go along with our prejudice and say, well, okay, black people, you know they're ignorant, so here's some ignorant music they came up with. Let's teach kids that. Go back and get Duke Ellington's music and get the music that is going to require you to learn something. And when you're teaching yourself, teach your students, and then they will be better off. Uh, teach, students don't require teachers to show them how to play the popular sound of the moment. Mm -hmm. I always was curious to me being in bands, how it is that every other subject in school had nothing to do with what I felt about it, but band, even basketball, but band was the one thing that was like, well, we want to play this. Oh, we got to play what the kids want to play. I didn't go to the basketball coach and say, I don't want to do these drills. I don't want to. And I certainly did not do that in English or, or history or, you know, any of the other subjects. So as teachers, we uh, use music. It can inspire inner growth and contemplation and discernment. It can teach you how to figure, figure out how to tell one thing from another and art puts you in contact with the mythic substance of human history. So we have a responsibility to teach our own tradition, be it's American traditions, because that's what we're talking about, but how our traditions fit into other traditions in the world. We don't have to do it all at once. Just give our students a sense of what the world is and try to be more and more acute. But the most important thing for us to do is to teach our students how to think and to perceive symbolically because music is a symbolic language. So everything down to how you sit, the songs you play, the function of your, your part, the history and traditions of the music you're playing, where it comes from, what it aspires to be, what the composer was, was like and about, and what does the music represent? What does it mean? It's like uh, sometimes I go to church services and people are playing like, like pop tunes and they're, they're joking like that. And they're joking. What does that have to do with church? Nothing wrong with joking on a, on a, at a Saturday dance, but this is church. So it's an understanding of meaning. And it also art informs your perspective and it helps you to develop your attention span, right? We want our students to be able to think over longer periods of time. And we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like I know there's a big thing about because you're addressing racism, you have to then disrespect great composers like Beethoven and Bach, and you don't have to do that. Because the, the standards that they set for, certain, for the style of music that they wrote in is an unbelievably high standard. And we don't have to discard that standard, because there's also a high standard in America that was set by people like, like Gershwin, who were, was aware of that tradition, Bernstein, Copeland, Ellington, Coltrane, Monk, and it's incumbent upon us to know that and teach our students that in this, these styles of music require you to have an attention span. And that's very important. It also teaches delayed gratification. You got to work on these pieces. They sound sad. Like a good friend of mine, Todd Stoll says, uh, uh, Vaughn Weister, friend of Fizz said, if it's worth, if it's worth playing, it's worth playing badly. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, if you sound sad playing Brahms, Fourth, okay, so be it. Uh, you know, I, I know I heard my son in one of the worst performances I ever heard of Tchaikovsky Fifth in, in middle school. And I, you know, I didn't, I started to laugh about it, but everybody acted like it was a crime. I said, wait a second, we go see these kids look t worse than that playing basketball and football, and nobody's mad about it. Okay, the band is sad. They're trying to play great music, and they will become much better because of your aspiration for them. And finally, I think that 
uh, when a community invests in the arts and in arts education and the things that we've been talking about, symbolic mythology and meaning and history and these things, they're more likely to be enlightened, informed, and they're more, more likely to be friendly to other people. And that's very, very important. The more ignorant you are, the more you're going to be hostile to strangers. So a, really, a relationship with the arts sharpens your judgment. Uh, and it influences both your per personal decision making and the decision making of a community. So when you walk into a band, into a band room, I know it's every day it's a grind. The students don't want to be there a lot of times. You got to find some way to motivate them. The parents don't know the importance of it. You know, people don't play. You got to remember to make it be the greatest experience uh, possible by challenging them to the nth degree and saying, that's great. We, we're going in this direction. Just kill them with your positivity. And your real power is in the strength and quality of the music you play. I can't stress that enough to band directors and music educators. Do not dumb down your music for students and parents. I Don't do it. I remember yeah. uh, meeting once with the, the mother of a high school student I was uh, teaching in a high school band, honor band setting. And the mom said to me, she said, I've noticed a change in my son since he's taken music. And I said, what's that? She says, well, he's discovered it's very difficult to hate people when you love their music. <laughs> there you go. And, you know, it just opens doors. You see, if you learn the real music. Yeah. And, you know, we're, I, we're, we're, we're educators. I, I remember, we're, not, we're not entertainers, you know. Uh, I remember in college reading a, a book that a teacher had recommended to me. It was a book called Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse. And at one point, there's a hallucinogenic dream of the of the, the main character. And he sees the ghost of Mozart who leads him down some caves. And they hear some, some music on a radio. It's got all this static on the AM channel that you and I grew up with. So they're trying to listen to this, Mo this Beethoven music uh, that it's got uh, static all over it. And the protagonist says, oh, it sounds horrible. And Mozart says, you're an idiot. Says, it's still Beethoven. Just listen through the static, you know. And that's right. what it's like when you're trying to play new music right. and you, you sound horrible. It's still great music, but you're going to get there if you, right. if you wade through and, and learn that long-term right. gratification. Right. So I think that for, for our teachers, yeah, defend yourself with the quality of your music and always try to learn more hmm. about and challenge your students. Make them come up to you. Don't. Don't don't go don't teach down. No matter how sad it is, make a joke out of it. You know, <laughs> and my son when he was playing clarinet when he was still squeaking, I'd be like, "Oh, I'm feeling you now." <laughs> but, you know, I played in the trumpet section with Marcus Belgrave, a great trumpet player, educator from Detroit. Played with Ray Charles. It's unbelievable. He passed on now, but whenever we, we would miss notes or we play a part that we didn't sound good, he would say, "You're playing with a lot of expression." <laughs> And the worse you play it, he say, "Boy, it's a lot of expression up here." That's you know, very maybe, gracious. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, shifting a little bit from the music educator standpoint to the the artist performing artist standpoint, although obviously the overlap can be huge. But for the performing artists, I'm I'm struck by artists in general and how they can uh, affect the world in ways that would not be anticipated. So, for instance, when I was growing up in New Orleans, there was in the Catholic school that I was going to, there was this comic book that came out. It was called Treasure Chest. I don't know if you ever ran across it, but mm. it, it was like a monthly comic book. It was actually distributed by the Archdiocese of New Orleans. So some point in the mid-60s, when I was about six years old or something, this comic book came out. Usually you'll see like biographies of Mother Teresa or this and that in comic book form, you know, educational stuff. And they had this like 10 part series over months. It was like a serialized comic strip and it was a presidential campaign set ahead in the far away future year of 1976. And it <laughs> went on for about literally for about 10 issues, like maybe almost a year. And at the end, on the final page, you discover that the winning candidate for the, the party convention for president of the United States is a black man. Now, this was a comic book distributed by the Archdiocese of New Orleans in the deep south in New Orleans in the middle of the 1960s. Right. But and I was shocked. And I mean, I was I was shocked in retrospect. I wasn't shocked then. I'm shocked uh -huh. in retrospect that it could happen. But I tell you that 50 years later, 
not yeah. a year goes by, not six months go by where I don't remember that. And mm -hmm. ever since I was like six years old, I always thought it was possible for a black man to be president because that mm -hmm. artist made it possible. So mm -hmm. along those lines, as as artists influencing things that are maybe indirect and yet direct, um, you know, in our native New Orleans, you certainly had an influence uh, on then Mayor Mitch Landrew when New Orleans was going through something that now my native Richmond is going through more recently in terms of what to do about statues uh, related to the Confederacy and to slavery. And, and you had a conversation with him that influenced his movement to decide several years ago, okay, we're going to take down some statues. So aside from the statue issue itself, which obviously people feel very different about, but just in terms of an artist in this time and in any time, having a chance to influence the world, influence the community, make a, make a mark in a way that, that uh, lasts. Um, I'd be curious to what thoughts you have. I remember one point you said something like, uh, and again, this conversation doesn't have to be related to statues, but you said something like, yes, it was history when people decided to put it up and it's history when they decide to take it down. It doesn't right. make it worse or better. It's just history. Um, and, and, and one doesn't preclude the other. So I just wondered, and we talked a little bit about music education, but from the standpoint of performing artists, if you have any particular thoughts about the performing artist's place in the world to make a statement that might actually resonate beyond the notes, for instance, as a musical performer. Everything we do is a part of what is being done. I know Abraham Lincoln, when he saw Harry Beecher Stowe, he had read Uncle Tom's uh, Cabin, and he said, this is the young lady that is responsible for this great war. Okay, he was he was joking, but she was a part of it. Mm. And I think that uh, if you take the 1960s, all of the consciousness music, like uh, We Shall Overcome was an anthem that, that we all uh, we all know and what we were aware of it. And you take the effect that the, that the that the, the American Negro spirituals had on people in the country. You take the effect of all of the folk music in the sixties, all of the, the answers blowing in the, in the wind and Peter Paul Berry and Bob Dylan. And you know, the list goes on and on of people who were, who were, who were dealing with consciousness music. And then in Afro-American music, people like James Brown and Marvin Gaye. And you start to get a baseline of understanding about uh, the power of of the arts. Now that said, how many how many artists were against the rise of of, of Nazism in Germany? Man, there were many. They didn't stop it. Picasso's Guernica against the Spanish Civil War didn't stop it. Um, it doesn't mean we should not we shouldn't be very forceful in presenting our vision of the world. And universal humanism is a very deep concept that the greatest artists have that. Beethoven's Ninth, that's the whole point of it. Universal humanism. And the greatest of artists are almost always universal humanists. You can find some people that aren't every now and then. Their creativity will be fueled by the kind of dislike of some group, but that's very rare. Mm -hmm. I could run down list after, and in America, it's really rare. The quintessential kind of American artist, if you want a white, person, let's say Walt Whitman, he was absolutely universal humanism 101. If you if you can accept the genius of a black person, Duke Ellington, universal humanist. So I believe in, in participating. And I don't really care whether people think Confederate statues should still be up. This is a democracy. We get to present our views and fight over what we think should be. And sometimes you win fights and sometimes you lose them. This only gives you the opportunity to fight without being killed. <laughs> That's what your opportunity is. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to win. It doesn't guarantee. You, the only guarantee is you have the opportunity to present your case and to go inside of the system and work with it and massage it and do what you can to create the change you would like to see and form coalitions and get together. It is the most civilized way to work with 300 and something million people with different viewpoints. We have more than two viewpoints on any subject. <laughs> Most people's viewpoints probably is not they should stay or they should go. <laughs> Most people have a very nuanced viewpoint. But what will happen will be one or two things. Either mm -hmm. my, my, my thought about it is to not be 
watered down talking about every statue that should go because I'm really not even a statue person. I very seldom even look at statues. But the question is when people are against democracy, they should not be celebrated in a democracy. And there's no such thing as a slave state that is libertarian. <laughs> the two things don't go together. Okay, you have to make a choice in those instances. In most things in life, you don't have to make a choice. If you think you go through your, your day every day and you believe one or two, you can believe two things. Sometimes you can believe two opposite things at the same time. Many times we have indecision about all kinds of things. When it comes to central and key things in our politics, sometimes you're forced to make a decision and a choice. And if you're an artist, you create music out of some type of consciousness and awareness, and you're interpreting a symbolic mythology. And your responsibility, should you choose to accept that, is to look at that mythology and report on what you see, on what you hear. And if you hear and see things that don't go what was popular, you just live in a, in a bad time for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but many times we compromise because it's just easier to do. Mm -hmm. You Only you can decide what you feel you're willing to compromise on. Like when I look at both of our parties, there are things I don't like about both of them. So then I have to start prioritizing. What, what do I, but when I'm put in a situation where I have to choose one or the other, and this one is evil and this one is great, I'm put in a bad, a bad, I mean, a pair of bad paradigm, but I do have to choose one or the other when I vote. That is, I do have to make that choice. So I start prioritizing. We have to, as artists, we prioritize. Some artists, they're not interested in being involved in social things and politics. They can write, they can, they can paint a beautiful internal life or a beautiful flower. Some people can write great lyric poetry of love songs, the most beautiful things you've ever heard. They're not, they're not gonna comment on police brutality like this. And that's okay. Some people don't like to sign autographs. There's nothing wrong with that. They play their concert, they wanna go home. Some people, you know, we all, we all are very different. But I think that the arts teach us how to perceive the world and understand our place in the world if we are taught the arts. <laughs> the easiest thing is to just teach entertainment. Mm -hmm. And we don't need that at this time. We are seeing now in our body politic the fact that we as citizens are not acute in our understanding of our way of government and the people that we put in charge in both parties, we're being exploited. We're being made a fool of. We need to take the time to figure out what's going on and what that what are, what is the extent of our power and we need to wield it. Now, when you speak about uh, presenting uh, viewpoints and presenting to audiences in particular, you know, it brings to mind the question that uh, it's true during the COVID era, but it's certainly going to be true in the post-COVID era when we get past this, uh, in terms of bringing in audiences and dealing with the budget concerns. Uh, bands and orchestras, which make up the vast majority of the attendees at the Midwest Clinic, bands and orchestras, their students, their directors, their communities, uh, bands and orchestras are a bit under threat. I mean, they're, they're uh, large organizations, it costs money, uh, they tend to play uh, often music that of people that precedes them, although there's a push now to play also more contemporary composers. So I wonder if you have, as from the viewpoint of a, of a performer, but also someone who, of course, is in charge of the direction of a major concert venue uh, at Jazz at Lincoln Center, uh, if you have some thoughts to share about how best to, to bring in audiences, maybe in the post-COVID era, how to diversify what it is we share with them so that they can find themselves in us. Uh, any, any, share, any thoughts to share, particularly for band and orchestra directors? Yeah, I think make it be personal. Call parents, get you. I've, I've, I've been to, done so many master classes and so many, been to so many band rooms. You know, so it's, it's a hobby. And I love band directors. I have to say, in all of my years of doing this, you know, it's 40 years now, basically, going into different directors' bands, hearing their students play, I've never had a bad experience with a band director. Elementary school bands, high school, college. People of great accomplishment, people of no accomplishment, rookies, veterans, people much older than me, much younger. I can I can say that uh, with, without equivocation. The band directors are so so under siege a lot of times, and they my my most 
when I go to bands, I always say, what do you want me to teach them? How can I work with what you're doing? I'm only here for X time. I want to work inside of a, yeah, and they always say, man, I, I just want my kids to, to play better. Or just, just don't be too hard on them. Or just try to see what my experience is. And am I going to be destructive to kids or constructive? Or I find band directors to be, you know, you're on civilized ground. And uh, I think that we're on, under siege in our communities uh, because we many times are the only line between a civilization and a type of barbarism when it comes to music. Music is under constant assault and threat. If you look at the public in the popular space, I'm going to tell you, as I've been saying for 30 years, it's only gotten worse. It is not the place for pornography. That's a mistake. I don't care who co-signs it. I don't care if it's what they're doing, but they've been doing it. We have to be aligned against that. It doesn't mean we have to crusade against that. We have to be against it by teaching good, solid, fundamental musical values and incorporate other stuff. It's not all only Europe. It's not the only place with great music. We're American. We have a tradition in this country. John Philip Sousa's band played ragtime in, in 1902, 1901, when they went to Europe. We have a tradition. We have a tradition that even has things that have sexuality in it. You can't deal with music and just take all the sexuality out of it. <laughs> Something has sexuality it doesn't mean it has to be pornographic. And we also have a spiritual tradition. We have a lot of traditions here that we need to teach our kids. But I think that for us in our communities, we got to go back to the old days of the world's finest chocolate sale or the, the, the church function trip that we're going to go 70 miles away to visit another, another church or the picnic or the, all the things that require us to reach out to a community and galvanize them around an experience for kids. And, uh, it just requires we have to do a lot more calling, a lot more talking, get our parents boosters group. I have to say that when the parents boosters or, or, the, or the, the band parents are together, you have almost always have a good band situation. When it's you trying to do it by yourself, it's a lot to lift up. So, you know, I, I would say first about the music, you will know more about the music than anybody you're dealing with in most instances. Use your knowledge wisely. Don't don't teach down, teach up and get your parents involved, get them around, get them involved in their kids and uh, be in the community. Schedule as many concerts as you can, get your band out. It doesn't matter how bad they sound. Embrace that. I love a good, bad sounding band. You know, <laughs> we're teaching them. They're going to get better. We all, we've been a part of sad bands, man. I've been a part of bands that were so sad. When I auditioned for high school in eighth grade, I was so sad playing that the band director looked at me and said, are you sure you're Ellis' son? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> you know, old George Marks at De La Salle. Yeah. And, you know, you know, you know, George. Yes, I, I know George. You, yeah, you he, know George he, yeah. he did Loyola Summer Band when we were both in the <laughs> summer band together. Yeah, George looked at me like, man, this is what, you, this is what you're dealing with? Wow, you can't play. And, you know, we, we, we're teaching kids to play. And once we give up on quality, then we're in trouble. Now record companies and commercial interests are running stuff. And I don't need a band director then. Mm -hmm. I get a kid out the band to teach the band. So, you know, that's, that's my advice for us in our communities. Be in that community. And there's a lot of extra work. Yeah. Calling people, getting them involved. But, you know, people will come around for their kids. Well, the payoff yep. is, is huge. The impact yep. on the students is, is immense. And yep. the only bad band is a no band. You know, when That's I was, right. you were at De La Salle, I was a Jesuit. And at right. Jesuit, we had a, you know, we had a concert band, right. but there was no jazz band until my senior year. Mm -hmm. I mean, there mm -hmm. was none. And mm -hmm. I didn't know who Miles Davis or Charlie Parker was or anything. And, right. and but it was when I got that opportunity, everything started shifting for me. And I found this, this love and I was, I was definitely sad at it, and uh, right. well, but we I was hungry, you know. And we're uh, all struggling. Right? And and boy, you know what an impact on a on a student's life to have an impact, whether it's classical, jazz, or otherwise. So, it, it, there's yep. the only bad band is not a is no band at all. Yes, you know, we played in plenty of sad bands, and uh, we learned from it. And we were we were many times the reason those bands were sad. Yes, and, and I have I the tapes to I, prove it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I burn minds. I don't I don't come to I don't want to see nothing with us with a seventies in it. I understand. But uh we have to build our community around us and be serious.
mm-hmm. be serious about it and keep going forward. Don't let the kind of the, the populism that's sweeping our country, don't fall victim to it. It's very provocative. You know, it's alluring. You want to put that shiny suit on, don't put it on. Before we wrap up, uh, you know, we've talked about educators and artists and, and uh, the bigger picture in terms of democracy, et cetera, just centering on the students, which have been part of all of this discussion, but in your interactions with students, especially during the pandemic, the last six months, seven months or so, you know, are you hearing anything in particular from students that, uh, uh, that they're, they're calling for, that they, they wish for, that uh, we should be, as educators, keeping our ears out for? Uh, you know, what, what's the tone? What are you hearing these days? You know, it de- depends on the students. I, I've, been, I've been talking to some students in, uh, in Africa. Oh, man, you know, they, they're so happy to be talked to that their, their vibe is up. Like, man, you know, wow, Zoom, you know, we can talk about music. Uh, I talked to, if, if I teach, I taught a younger class, little kids, they just, you know, give them songs to sing and get them involved in stuff, man. They just happy to have something to do that's not just be in their homes. Mm-hmm. Right? Now we're stuck at home. Now we can have a music class. We can dance and sing a song. And when you get to middle school and high school kids, it's a trickier because they have other concerns. But my main thing with our kids is don't be spoiled. Yeah, okay, this is a rough time. It's a pandemic, it's rough on your parents. People losing jobs, there's a lot going on. I don't want to hear whining. Like, yeah, it's, 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 stuff, it's, it's stuff going on. People losing loved ones, pa- pa- parents, grandparents dying. Uh, a lot of problems in our country. We, you, you see what's going on. Pro- problems with, that, that, we, that we need to address is going to be left to you to address. So we need you to be much stronger and more creative. Hey, I don't even know how to get on a Zoom call. Help, show me how to work this thing, you know? I'm, I'm always dealing with them on a very human level. And I love the students. And I don't require them uh, to be to figure out everything overnight. Like we were talking about how sad we were. They're not going to figure it out. But we all we can do is set the standard for them and show the respect and love we have for one another. I like to get on my calls with students with another teacher and have that teacher who I know maybe doesn't agree with me on everything. So they will come in and say, well, actually, I think it's this or it's that. And then it gives me the opportunity to say, well, it could be that. There's not one way for something to be right. And yes, it could be. And it could be for them to see respect and to understand. And uh, to understand that, that how much uh, relies on them, but that we're the adults. Not them. We're the adults. And it's up to us to set the environment for them. I used to work in a gas station. Old guy named Bossy Clay used to always say, boy... I've been your age, you ain't been mine. And so we would tease him because he had a funny way of talking. And he was always saying we were lazy, we didn't do work, we didn't know the wheel, we were dumb as a carburetor. You know, he had all these kind of lines he would say. And it, it, and then, you know, you, so he was always kind of cussing you out, but I always go back to that saying and it make me laugh because he'd be muttering to himself, boy, you know, this is 1960, that gas was like 28 cents a gallon at right. that time. To give you a sense of how long ago it was. But I was thinking, that I've been your age, boy. You ain't been mine. So it's just, we said it. Uh, so I always, for my students, try to set up positivity, uh, a, a belief, the need for their creativity and their insight, uh, the space for them to, st- to talk and counter state. But the, when we make a decision in this context, I'm making this decision because that's my role. Hmm. You know, and I think kids... They want that. I, I don't think that the whole experiment of adults being run by kids, that's not working for us. Right. That's not, that's not a good equation. I've you know, they're going to have their chance for leadership. Mm-hmm. And when their chance comes, we want to hope we can bow out gracefully and give them space. And we want to hope that they are qualified to reflect the deepest and most sacred and important of our values. Right. We're seeing it played out right now in our electoral much corruption as we have. Man, we have so much corruption in our system all across the line of Democrat Republic. It's a national problem we have that we need to root out and we need to start by teaching our young our most sacred and highest values, even if we fall short of them. Teach that to them and they will respond and our students want that and they'll love us for it later. (laughs) They may not be that enthusiastic right now, but that's part of the dynamic of a teacher 
You think back when we were growing up, did we love every teacher? Did I love what George Marks told me I was sad? <laughs> no, but he was right. I hear you. George Jansen. You remember George Jansen? Oh, yeah. My, my father was his physician, so, oh, uh, man. yeah. I got, to play in the, I got to play in his UNO brass quintet years after you moved out. I got to play uh, in a little bit and uh, benefit from his wisdom. Oh, man, I, I loved him. He taught me so much. Yeah, many, many you people. Know, yeah, he taught many of us, so we owe it to him. I remember he threw me out of a lesson once. <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't practicing. All the little kids would, then I was like a junior in high school. So all the little kids would sit outside the room when I was having a, a, a lesson, and, you know, they looked up to me. And to have him shout me out of a room, and you know, in Loyola, when you open that door, <laughs> all the wood, it get out. And you know, he the way he talked, man, that was embarrassing. That, that was one of the most embarrassing things, even to this age, that I've ever had happen to me in my life. <laughs> but it was well deserved. I went home to my daddy. I said, "Man, Jansen threw me out of the class," and he said, "Well, did you deserve it?" I reflected on. I said, "Yeah, I deserved it." <laughs> he said, "Well, call him." I called him. I always called him Mr. J. I said, "Hey." Could I could I come back for lessons next week? He said, no. No, don't come back. You're not serious. And he hung the phone up. <laughs> <laughs> I told my daddy, he hung up on me. He said, give him a little while to cool off. You know, so I waited a week, week and a half. I called him back. Can I come back? Can I come back for a lesson? He said, are you, are you going to be prepared? Are you going to be ready for lessons? I promise I'm going to be ready. He said, okay, come back in two weeks. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, by then I was already working and gigging, and you know, right? You know, you know. yeah. So it's we we need we need you know we need we need that adult hand. Mm -hmm. We are, we are the adult hand. We don't need to follow. We need to lead. Well, I hope you feel the love and appreciation from the Midwest Clinic and from our attendees. Uh, it's, hearing your thoughts today very helpful to so many. Uh, but I know we've had a chance to have you perform with us and speak to us in person before and, and I and we look forward to the opportunity when we can do that again when we get past this virus and can reunite with thousands of us together in celebration of this musical art and of the expression of humanity that you speak of. So thank you so much. Man, thank you. You know, it's something to see you and how we knew each other in high, in high school. High school. And the love and respect I have for you. And you always like how you are now. You know, you always had a beautiful spirit and always had kind of a deep spirituality and a passion. And I'm not just saying that. I could recognize it then. Man, and uh, I'm, I'm so proud kind, of you, man. And I'm so, so proud to be talking to you. And for all the, all the band directors and everybody, you know, I love y'all. And, and, and we, got, we, we got to go uphill, but we just got to arm ourselves. That's what we do. They just to talk about and it. it's what we do best. That's it. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> handle our business. Well, thank Let's you, my friend. It. Appreciate it very, very oh. much. All right, Tony. You much have a love. great Thanksgiving. Right. Much love back to All you. Right. All right, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. You take care. All right. Much love, man. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We as citizens have to become more involved. I believe in, in participating. This is a democracy. We get to present our views and fight over what we think should be. And sometimes you win fights and sometimes you lose them. The fact that we as citizens are not acute in our understanding of our way of government and the people that we put in charge in both parties, we're being exploited. We're being made a fool of. We need to take the time to figure out what's going on and what, that, what, are, what is the extent of our power and we need to wield it. Education is tied to aspiration. Get the music that is going to require you to learn something. And when you're teaching yourself, teach your students. And then they will be better off. But the most important thing for us to do is to teach our students how to think and to perceive symbolically. Because music is a symbolic language. Now, when a community invests in the arts and in arts education, and the things that we've been talking about, symbolic mythology and meaning and history and these things, they're more likely to be enlightened, informed, and they're more, more likely to be friendly to other people. And that's very, very important. The more ignorant you are, the more you're going to be hostile to strangers. And for all the, all the band directors and everybody, you know, I love y'all. Much love, man. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, you're right.